Hey, True Seekers, welcome back. I'm very, very excited. It's been a while. We took the New Year's off, got the resolutions taken care of, and we're kicking things into gear today. My guest is an associate editor of Commentary Magazine. He's the author of the most recent and first book, Unjust, Social Justice and the Unmaking of America. Please welcome Noah Rothman. Mr. Rothman, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so I got a lot of questions. The first one is, for people who are sick and tired of hearing the term social justice, what are you going to tell them today that's going to keep them from going, oh, no, I just want it to go away? Uh, Because I got to be honest, when I saw your book, I thought, do I want to know anything more about social justice? Is this going to benefit me or am I just going to be rolling my eyes the whole time about our culture circling the drain? What say you? I'm sort of surprised that you're familiar with it at all. I encounter a lot of people who who don't really know what the term is. Um, And that's sort of understandable because it doesn't really have a common definition and its most committed advocates uh, seem to use it as a malleable term. And so most Americans probably don't really know what it is. They might even think it's a pretty unobjectionable idea, just a way to think about fairness and equality in a just society and addressing historical grievances. But unfortunately, uh, it's not that anymore. It has become the antithesis of blind objective justice. Uh, it is the enemy of justice as we know it. And uh, just pretending that it's just going to go away and ignoring it is unfortunately proven insufficient for addressing the, the, the systemic effects that it has had on American culture, business culture, personal culture, interactions with just in- individuals, remaking academia, and certainly reshaping our politics. Uh, it's a phenomenon that I think is, is pretty dangerous and it needs to be confronted pretty, pretty aggressively. It's true. If you talk to a layman, unfortunately, I pay way too much attention. But uh, if you talk to a layman, social justice kind of sounds good. Of course, it's not social and it's not just, as you point out. But why is it so pervasive? Kind of go through some. I haven't finished the book, but so far I'm really enjoying it. Talk about the pervasiveness and the dangerous ideology that's kind of sprouting out of this pleasant sounding idea of being socially just everybody. Right. Yeah. In part because it's so malleable, it can apply to so many facets of life, and uh, that's why we've seen it proliferate in, throughout just about every sector. Um, in its activist class, the form in which it takes in its most committed activists, it has become something that is so opposed to what we understand true historic justice to be that uh, it can be difficult to see where where that began. Um, the activist class, uh, mostly on the left, but not exclusively, social justice is a phenomenon that ex- that uh, encompasses both the extreme left and the extreme right. Oh. And it, for its activists, it uh, it advocates things that are just antithetical to the American tradition, the idea that meritocracy is a myth, that your course in life is essentially predestined in many ways because of your accidents of birth, that separatism, racial, demographic, or otherwise, is good explicitly because it prevents social discomfort and colorblindness and as, as an institutional demand is naive at best and dangerous at worst. And when I tell, when I have conversations with social activists, social justice activists on the left, and I tell them that white supremacists believe all this stuff too, they sort of look at me funny as though they'd never thought of it that way. Uh, <laughs> there are more distinct, more similarities between these two fringes than there are distinctions. And these are obstacles on the pathway to addressing real racial uh, disparities, real institutional discrimination, and they are lies, which is fortunately a good thing. But you're you're not going to see anybody jump up and down on the social justice left when they hear that. These are almost religious concepts to them, articles of faith. And it's simply an obstacle to addressing true – to creating true equality, to addressing – the founding ideals and making them more uh, manifest in American daily life. The cure for bigotry is not more bigotry. And that is unfortunately what so much social justice activism today prescribes. I think I told this story once a year or two ago. I don't know if you remember in Phoenix, um, we had this pizza shop in Tucson and they basically said, because of the bigotry and the anti-gay bias, we are no longer going to serve any, this is before MAGA. So it might've been two years ago. They refused to serve certain types of people. And I was in a Facebook group with some people I knew arguing about this, which is why I have to stay off Facebook now. And I said, isn't it ironic that your answer to all these bigoted people is to be bigoted against them? And you just get crickets. I think inherently they realize it's kind of a stupid thing to do, but what else is there aside for saying you're now bad, you're the other, I have to shun you. And I want to kind of build on the idea that you're talking about of how bigotry begets more bigotry. It's not the answer. I think somewhere in the book you mentioned, um, let me see if I can find it here. You said that the kind of pure justice that social justice advocates insist upon is a moving target. Uh, We need to expose it for what it is, the antithesis of fairness and impartiality. It's arbitrary, impulsive, and often spiteful. 
If that's the case, right. why do so many people think it's the, why do why does it have this illusion of being something that's a solution out of the problem? Well, well I, 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 again, it's totally understandable if you don't have a whole lot of a, a interaction with social justice advocates or uh, members of the so-called alt-right who in many ways mirror the social justice activist on the left. Um, social justice is a concept that originates out of the Catholic Church in the late 19th century, and it was originally a way just to think about charity and one's obligation to one's fellow man. Uh, in the late 60s, early 1970s, a philosopher named John Rawls put some meat on these bones, identifying the ways in which historical grievances could be rectified by institutions if we begin to think about justice a little differently, which has very little to do with the conduct of uh, criminal affairs in the courtroom. It is a way to think about historical grievances and how uh, groups have been uh, historically privileged or historically uh, suffer from uh, the conditions under which uh, their ancestors labored. And so they benefit today from uh, effects, social effects that they might not even be aware of. So John Rawls says, OK, well, we need to think of justice like a finite community, or a commodity that must be distributed by enlightened distributors. But how do you become an enlightened distributor? And the only real way to do that is to operate from behind a theoretical construct that he called the veil of ignorance so that the enlightened distributor wouldn't know who's being the beneficiary of his distribution so that even his biases, conscious or otherwise, could not be satisfied with that distribution. The modern social justice activist has no use for John Rawls' veil of ignorance. That is a moral uh, failure to not know exactly who you are benefiting and who you are uh, disprivileging is to not know who is uh, historically ag aggrieved and who are the aggressors and who are the oppressed and who needs to be lifted up and who needs to be tamped down. So you have to have a very four square understanding of uh, historical uh, uh, injustices and who deserves retribution and redress and who deserves to uh, have a comeuppance. Um, and unfortunately, this is not a new idea. Uh, and I think we, we just need to relearn the lessons of why treating individuals unequally in order to achieve equality is a failed paradigm that only results in more grievances spanning generations and creating more hostility and conflict. It's the precise opposite way of going about the, the noble cause of achieving true equality and true justice in historical terms. What I'd really like to do once I post the recording is is splice in a clip. I was watching some clips of you doing interviews and reading up some commentary magazine, which I wasn't familiar with. I'll certainly link to it below. Some fantastic content there. Um, but you had an interview on MSNBC. And for people who don't know, you're a you're contributor to MSNBC or NBC or is it the same thing? Uh, yes, MSNBC and NBC News. Okay, so you're on a panel with Joe Scarborough, who wrote one of the forwards to your book, and I saw something very interesting. The two people who were critiquing your work both admitted, one said they read the outtakes, one didn't read it at all, and they're basically projecting what their understanding is of your understanding of fairness based off of what they don't know that's written in the book. And I felt like that kind of, ju <laughs> for me, that wrapped up the definition of uh, social justice pretty well. But it's a lot of the same type of language about how you don't understand historic injustices, you don't understand uh, people that are essentially defined as being behind the eight ball and don't have the same privilege, this, this language that they use. I saw it recently on a video where Vice brought together black conservatives and black liberals or progressives. And I was shocked by the black liberals listening in, in horror to the conservatives talk about how if you would just work harder and try harder and rely on yourself. And they respond with, yeah, yeah, but you don't understand. We need reparations. We need to right the historical wrongs. You know, there are certain people that have had it too easy for too long. And my basic question is the American History X question of like, what about any of this is going to make your life better? They're talking about, what, you know, Barack Obama, he was disappointing. We need to find the right person who's going to come along and really understand the black experience because we just realized he didn't know enough about it. I'm thinking, this is this a recipe for failure, misery, or both? Yeah, and, and, I, sort of, and I don't take any issue with the notion that, for example, so most of what I get, the pushback I get, and by the way, that panel was, was great. I'm very privileged to have been a part of it. And it's sort of understandable that nobody had a chance to really digest the book because it had only just come out 24 hours prior. Okay, that's So fair. I don't, I don't fault anybody for not having read it. Um, and, and some of my interlocutors on that, on that panel, I've become pretty friendly with in, in the meantime. So it was a really great experience. And the book does not advocate for, um, ignorance. It doesn't advocate for the notion that, 
you uh, should operate yourself personally from behind a veil of ignorance, that you should ignore the historical grievances and injustices and modern day injustices that are suffered by people who have experiences that are distinct from your own, that are resultant from their, uh, their race, their creed, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation or gender or what have you. Um, Self-actualization and racial awareness is is a good thing. It's how you uh, interact with the society with a fuller understanding of your fellow man. And reparative justice, as you described it, reparations, for example, is um, is also a debatable concept and one I don't get into in the book. It is retributive justice, the notion that retribution and historical comeuppance is due to certain members of demographic tribes, uh, ethnic tribes, affiliations, collective groups that don't distinguish individuality, that don't identify individual extenuating circumstances, in fact, that reject the notion that individuality is something that an institution that is dedicated to social justice should consider. That is the problem. That is the threatening uh, condition, because when we begin to uh, operate in that fashion and see, people's not as, see people not as people, but as representatives of a particular class, then we begin to dehumanize them. And once you dehumanize somebody, you can do a lot of things to them. And that's what we've seen in, in societies that have dedicated themselves to this kind of historical retribution in the name of justice. And it has only resulted in more inequality, more unfairness, and uh, more, more uh, conflict. And that's the kind of thing that I'm hoping to address and desperately hoping to avoid. I want to talk a little bit more about that. We've been talking about the idealism and, and the high-minded ideas of the book, but let's bring it back to the everyday application. So there's a lot of things you talk about. I'm going to kind of wrap them under the bundle of the paradox of equality, right? What is that and how does it apply to things like um, Title IX and college campuses and, un and business practices, unethical workplaces, and the way that it's structuring certain things we take for granted in society? Talk about the application of the ideas you talk about in your book. Yeah, sure. Um, so just to name one, I mean, it's it's, it's it's too. It's very expansive to get into all of the examples, but just to name one, um, the the uh, application of social justice nostrums in public policy uh, is very detrimental to the application of justice as we understand it, and probably one of the uh, least well known but most galling examples of that is this idea that sexual assault survivors, alleged sexual assault survivors, have the, quote, right to be believed. That's what Hillary Clinton said in 2016, uh, and it originates out of uh, feminist intersexual, uh, intersectionality theory. And it's very a popular idea, and it's one that has been applied in practice, essentially, in 2011, after Barack Obama's Dear Colleague letter, which told colleges and universities, state colleges and universities, how they can address sexual uh, assault allegations on campus, in part because the American judicial system, in theory, was simply not equipped to address sexual assault allegations because it defined the terms too narrowly. And the conditions on that it applied to uh, addressing those grievances re-victimized individuals who were uh, allegedly victimized because it forced them to confront their accusers and what have you in court. So the standards for adjudicating those claims were much lower in these on-campus star chambers. And when those claims and the verdicts, quote unquote, in those claims actually went to a real court, a lot of the times they found that the accuser and accused were made, made victims of because they were deprived of their constitutional rights, their Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights to things like uh, evidentiary standards and cross-examination and even right to counsel. These things were abridged. Millions of dollars were paid out to the victims of these star chamber courts, uh, and many uh, individuals were victimized in the process. So in an effort to achieve this sort of historical equality and expand the definition of justice, reboot it essentially, they created a whole class of new victims. That happens not infrequently and identify a lot of the ways in which that has happened in the book. You would think a constitutional law professor would have the vision or the judgment to understand what the net effect would be of a policy like that. So it might not be fair for us to judge intentions, but what are they? Why are they doing well, this? Well, the, the intentions are noble and the intentions are just. And, and for, I'm hoping that we can salvage social justice from the hands of its activist class that does not cherish it. Um, they have perverted it. And in many ways, they've sacrificed, in, in, in order to, to appeal to these ideas, they have sacrificed just basic skepticism and circumspection and common sense. Uh, and that's allowed them to be pretty gullible. And there's a chapter in, in this book that is a little bit more uh, light 
Uh, these are pretty heavy concepts, but this is a, it's a, a bit of lighter concept because most of the social justice activism that you see in, in, the, in the modern public square isn't really about politics at all. It's about pop culture and obsessing over the conditions that dominate uh, t- television and film and comic books and food trucks and all sorts of banalities that suffice for political activism. And the most, the most uh, visible manifestation of that is this new phenomenon of woke capitalism in which brands identify and uh, wade into cultural controversies that have a tangential relationship to politics but really aren't politics. They have nothing to do with legislative affairs or Congress or the Constitution or the Federalist Papers, anything that we understand to be the conduct of politics writ large. And the best perhaps example of that is the phenomenon of fearless girl. Fearless Girl was a little bronze statue of a, a, a school, a grade school age girl standing arms akimbo, challenging directly across from the iconic Wall Street bull. And this was feted by Democratic politicians as a bold and noble challenge to the patriarchal status quo in the financial services industry. Uh, Democrats said it was really a, an affront to the patriarchy. You had people like Elizabeth Warren make pilgrimages to lower Manhattan to be photographed next to this thing. And it didn't take long before we realized that this was a commercial for a Wall Street investment firm and one that had been, in (laughs) fact, found after a Department of Labor audit to have been systematically discriminating against against its female employees, had to pay out several million dollars in a settlement. Uh, And it's just a demonstration of how the social justice nostrums, these dictates of this idea, force you to abandon discretion, to surrender critical thinking in order to give yourself over to these uh, these political ideas that are that are really statements of faith. Uh, and, and it's dangerous, obviously, to the to the social compact, but also just one's critical thinking capacity. Uh, there's also many examples of that in this book. So let's talk about that a little bit um, in terms of, you know, one of the things about bad ideas is they tend to collapse on top of each other. So when I was reading about AOC potentially getting a Democratic primary in her home state, or you read about the, you know, the problem that socialists are having right now or progressives looking at Venezuela and, and trying to um, Houdini themselves out of the, uh, to not lay blame on their socialist ideas, eventually social justice is going to make people miserable. Uh, but you try to advocate that the pursuit of retributive justice has actually made us better people. I'm not fully through this concept yet, so I want to see if you can help me flesh it out. A retributive justice? No, I don't think retributive justice has any redeeming traits whatsoever. Um, reparative justice uh, is is something that I understand had has a place, uh, and I sort of go through the literature a little bit briefly because it's it's pretty academic stuff about where the place in society for adjudicating claims based on collective grievances outside a judicial system, outside an Anglo-Saxon understanding of what common justice really is. And uh, that has a place, but the place is really in a post-conflict society, a society that has been rocked with injustice and that has recently, for example, had a major regime change or even a civil war. Um, those are uh, those are institutions and ideals to which you can appeal, and the United States appealed to them essentially in the Reconstruction period. Um, but the idea behind that that America now needs some sort of a extrajudicial uh, system, a la what was applied in the uh, in the in the post 2011 dear colleague moment for these students who were accused of sexual assault, expanding the definition of justice and adjudicating those claims outside of court. Uh, That idea rests on the notion that the United States is now and forever will be a post-conflict society, and it's simply a flawed paradigm. It's just wrong. It does not meet the measure of the moment. It's not objective, and it it cannot be substantiated with objective facts on the ground. Uh, And and so you have these constructs that are erected in in the heads of its advocates catastrophizing just really basic day-to-day banalities, uh, essentially convincing themselves that the uh, that their external conditions are so dangerous, uh, existentially dangerous to their right to exist and their group's right to exist, that they have to work themselves up into this frenzy to justify their program, which is very antithetical to the American ideal and the rule of law. Uh, and, and these constructs, and they are constructs, need to be attacked at root. And this book is a way for us to begin to identify what social justice is and how it manifests in the real world in those constructs. And then finally, to stigmatize those ideas and to isolate them before they become something that uh, that does irreparable damage to the social fabric. 
So I identify as center right primarily because it aligns with most of the values, you know, the Judeo Christian values that I have. But uh, you talk about this idea that social justice sometimes masquerades as patriotism or nationalism, and we have it on the right as well. I think the real watershed moment for me was in Charlottesville. I still think, as Ben Shapiro says, the ratio is like 10 or 20 to 1 of events on one side or the other. But you kind of look at that and go, you know what? Maybe there is a problem. Maybe there are some people here that I really think are low lives so that are giving us a bad name. How do we attack this? What do we do about it? Yeah. I want to I talk about the balance that you strike in the book between the, the same issues we have on the right as the left in terms of social justice. What are they? Yeah, well, like I said earlier, I find the distinction between the the far right uh, white nationalists who are identity obsessed and convince themselves that they are aggrieved and that there are ill-defined forces placing obstacles before them that uh, that are in, insurmountable, um, that prevent them from achieving their due, and that they've been robbed historically, and they appeal to a strong hand to restore that which is rightfully theirs. I find that line of thinking not so dissimilar from the social justice left to the point where I fail to draw a distinction in the book between the two of them. They are, to me, two sides of the same coin. And I go through some of the philosophical roots of the uh, the, the basis, for the foundational ideas that animate the alt-right. And uh, while this is social justice is primarily a phenomenon of the left, uh, it's not exclusive, and I devote a, a substantial amount of attention to these parallel forms and also how you identify a way in which they can be stigmatized and isolated, not the individuals themselves who might be attracted to some of these ideas, but the ideas. Um, and this has been done before. Uh, the, uh, the notion here is that essentially, for example, you might be attracted to some of these ideas, and social justice activists on the left might be attracted to some of these ideas, and some of these ideas are, have value. But the way in which they manifest now is dangerous and un unproductive to the way in which we all want to see change in this country. If you and I agree on certain platform principles and say we, have, we affiliate more with the Republican Party than the Democratic Party because of those shared principles, that these ideas that animate this little fragment of this coalition are dangerous to those ideas – because they prevent us from appealing to a broader group that we need to appeal to to get a mass coalition together and achieve 50 plus one at an election day. Um, so in a pragmatic sense, it is necessary for us to begin to isolate and stigmatize those ideas, if only because we want to see more programmatic uh, elements of our uh, preferred political coalition advanced at the polls. And Democrats have a model to appeal to if they wanted to do this. They can look at how Democrats in the late 1940s uh, identified, isolated, and stigmatized the communists and the organized labor movement, successfully removing them from the coalition. Republicans can look to how William F. Buckley and Barry Goldwater and Russell Kirk identified, isolated, and stigmatized the Bircher movement, the conspiratorial and paranoid Bircher movement. Uh, and those were successful ways in which not individuals were abandoned and shunned from a coalition. No political party in the right mind would want to abandon or shun anybody who's a member of their political party. But certain ideas, I think, can be isolated, can be identified as uh, unproductive elements of a political coalition and eventually withdrawn and shunned from that pol political coalition. Yeah. I'm fascinated by how often, like if we were just sitting around the living room being chummy and wonky about this, or after you have your chat on MSNBC and you go into the green room and I would classify differently. I'd say my big issue is that like being Christian, we have a lot of friends who I call them the Christian socialists who believe that you just have a responsibility to take care of everybody. And no matter what it costs or what the policy is or what the, um, what the expense is, you just do it because it's the right thing to do. And for me, that overlaps with the leftist social justice movement of there are certain people who owe a debt to society because they have so much. And as I've gotten older, I've reconciled a lot of these ideas. I mean, one of them, and this is, we don't know each other at all, but I was arguing with someone who's very, very pro-abortion. And she goes, look how many people get killed in the Bible for no reason. You know, God just says it's okay. I started talking to my wife and saying, you know, you could stretch and make the argument that, uh, that, that if it's in the best interest for these people who are the children of heathens not to grow up in that environment, not to learn how to worship heathens, not to kill Israelites, that maybe in the long run it's better that God, like the argument for the flood, that he prevents them from living that life rather than have them be evil, heathen, God-haters the rest of their life. And we actually came to this compromise that there is a similar principle that we share. And then I went home thinking, did I really – See eye to eye on a pro-abortion <laughs> argument, but I, that's the thing I look for in these conversations of, can we not say it's right wing and left wing? Can we say that the Democratic Party is structured to appeal to people who want to believe that there is a reason for them to act and 
uh, project themselves as a victim and that ultimately that's not in their best interest. And the left wing capitalizes on that more than the right wing. Is that fair? And then we have a conversation from there. Yeah, I'll admit there are crazies in the right wing. I don't like it, but I don't like the fact that in the 2020 Olympics, I've got the popcorn ready because you've got this giant minority victimized Olympics coming up. Like who's going to be the person that promises the most, that says that they're sorry for white people the most, that America hates you the most? Like, that's just a destructive thing to do. And part of me brings joy out of the fact that this is how the Democratic Party destroys itself, whereas they tell us we're just going to be um, demographically put into non-existence because there won't be enough of us to stop the avalanche. Um, that's not really a question, but I'm curious. You wrote the book. You've got the impetus to try to educate people on this. What does the future look like? What do we do about this problem? Yeah, well, there's uh, I'm, and there's a real distinction to be drawn, as we drew earlier, between charity and the idea that there are historical grievances and historical oppression and ex current disparities and how we address that in a pragmatic fashion. And, uh, you know, one of the something that just happened late last year, a Republican Congress passed and a Republican president signed uh, a legislation to address uh, disparities in the criminal justice system, which tacitly acknowledged racial disparities in the criminal justice system, sure. which are real and frustrating and uh, and something that we shouldn't tolerate as a fair and just society. And while activists might be disappointed by how far it went, it was only a first step, but a first step nonetheless. And that was a good thing and it should be addressed as a good thing. And uh, that coalition wasn't formed around these reparative notions of social justice. Nobody built a coalition by telling people to sit down, shut up and watch your privilege. Uh, it was addressed as a result not of a reparative and paranoid and, and bitter philosophy, but of appealing to shared ideals, the ideals of the American founding, to which we, we don't always live up to, but that's what ideals are. Ideals are aspirational. Um, there's something to aspire to, not necessarily something you always embody. And, and I, I've, I've encountered that in, the, in, when I'm in conversations all the time, of frustration over the notion that even identifying American ideals as something that are, that are valuable – um, it, it results in this in this very emotional, frustrated backlash because we we have failed uh, to live up to them on many occasions, and it's it that doesn't negate the value of those aspirations. They are nevertheless always going to be aspirational, and the the aspiration alone is valuable. But that's a digression. Um, the what you what to appeal to that sort of uh, to that sort of idea is what I do in this book is that there are pragmatic ways to approach creating political coalitions and mostly most most of all you appeal to self-interest you say that you have these ideas you think they're existential moral values and the way to do to to advance those is to appeal to another individual self-interest who maybe either shares those ideals or is skeptical of them but has other ideals and wants to to pr present the base, best face forward um you, you don't do that through hostility and you certainly don't do that through ret retribution and the notion that certain tribes and classes uh, deserve a, a comeuppance and the heavy hand of the state pushing down on them and what they've done. Uh, and because social justice activism is so uh, married to this notion that there needs to be grand historical retribution from, meted out by the state and it must be uh, – it can't be incremental. It must be radical. Um, they become very frustrated very quickly because American institutions aren't designed to do that. American institutions are designed to do incrementalism, and that's it. We don't do radical reforms in, these country, in this country. So the, one of two things happens to you when you think that your absolute existential moral imperatives are not being addressed. One, you get very dispirited, and you withdraw from the political process. You say, throw your hands up and say, this isn't worth my time. And that's not great. But what's worse is the second reaction, which is to resolve to become radicalized, to resolve that these institutions that I thought I could work within are so uh, blind to the injustice and immorality around us that they cannot be allowed to survive. And then you resolve to attack the foundations of those institutions, and that manifests in street violence. And we've seen more of it in this decade than we've seen in the last generation, and I think that's a trend. So one of the things you did earlier when you talked about John Rawls that I really like is going back to the kind of genesis of where these ideas come from and how they develop. I, enjoy, I had D'Souza on a year ago talking about the founding fathers of fascism, like the first guys who got together and started discussing this. What did they want to accomplish? What were they hoping to do? What, how did they think, feel, and act? And then I just read Jonathan Haidt's book where he's talking about intersectionality and white privilege and where these ideas started festering on college campus and why they appeal to iGens. 
What are the revelations are people going to get reading your book about social justice? What historical insights will benefit them to see kind of through the uh, the day to day talking heads arguments about these ideas that will help them shape their opinions? Well, you know, and I'm just in the middle of uh, reading uh, Lukanoff and Hate's book right now, and I tried to avoid it until this book was published <laughs> because I knew there was going to be some parallel thinking there, but I didn't know how much parallel thinking there was until I'm reading it. So I was, I would have been very self-conscious publishing this manuscript had I read uh, John and John and Greg's book. Okay, you're because, off the uh, hook. Disclaimers out there. You're good. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic book, by the way. I definitely recommend it. But it we share good. a lot of the uh, a lot of the prescriptions. And uh, and the uh, the diagnoses too. Um, I think as far as history goes, you're going to appreciate the very cursory, but as deep as I can, examination of how retributive social justice manifests itself in the United States over the course of 200 years, 240 years of history. You know, it's a, it's only a chapter, so it's a brief excerpt from history. But these are a lot of stories I think that aren't really well told. So hopefully, this is new information to you. Also, an exploration of the philosophy behind social justice, based rooted in ancient philosophical inquiries about what justice is, uh, and some of the uh, dialogue that occurred between John Rawls and the attack on Rawls' theory by Frederick Hayek uh, in in the chapter on philosophy, and then some of the really silly ways in which social justice activism manifests itself, really small things. Because as social justice activists have become more militant and more aggressive, their movement has become, while broader in scope, smaller in scale. They resolve only now to attack the members of their own coalition because those are the only people who are listening anymore. So they go after comic book creators and film promoters and liberal chefs and artists and anybody and anybody who will genuflect and supplicate to this movement and its increasingly radical demands. Uh, and and while that has – that can make you feel better about this thing because it's narrow and it's unlikely to affect your life. The militancy there is becoming far more aggressive and far more threatening to anybody who's caught in the crossfire. Uh, so there's a lot of things I think that are valuable in this book that are new and, um, and are, are geared towards a general interest audience for somebody who's never had any experience with social justice activism. It defines it. It helps you to see it when it's, when it's manifest in front of your face and a way in which we can navigate society and try to isolate these ideas before they really become something that that just is a fire that burns out of control. I don't know how far along you are, but you'll appreciate this. When I started doing this podcast a couple of years back, uh, Greg Lukianoff had just come out with his book about unlearning liberty when he was running fire, and I think he still runs it, but I'm, I'm very much an outsider. I just do this because I'm very much an advocate for the ideas and the thoughts and the truth-seeking. And so I had contacted his office and said, hey, I'd really love to have you on. And a while went by and he emailed back, said, not feeling so hot. Maybe I'll come on later. And then eventually I got a, hey, how about, how about instead you interview one of my guys? So when I'm reading Hate's book, it talked about Greg Lugianoff getting ill and being depressed and being suicidal. And I checked the dates and that was about the time that I was reaching out to him. And I was so, it made it so much more impactful to read this book and go, here's a guy who's a champion of liberal ideas, who's doing all this great work on campus and he's going home at night and thinking about killing himself. Like, this is wild. I was blown away by it. And then reading Hate's words and listening to him confront some of the ideas he held as axiomatic and putting some of the blame on the left. I think that's one of the most productive things about the book because it reminds me that there are a bunch of things that I think are 100% true that might not be. They might be a little bit askew. And uh, and so I always think about Lukianoff going home and thinking about you know ending life when I'm reaching out to him saying, hey, you're, you're this great guy. You're really smart. I want to talk to you about these ideas. And what is it that causes people to despair? So, And so that's a lot of – for people listening – and there's a younger audience on YouTube, but that's a lot of what I get out of this, knowing the historical challenges and the philosophy and the things that are in here help you deal and navigate with all the BS that comes out of the movement today and, uh, and also kind of help you visualize where it's going. So um, what's, uh, if you had to pick one chapter, like if someone picks up your book and says, I only have time to read one chapter, where should they start? What's an epiphany that they definitely don't want to miss out on? You mentioned some stories. You didn't tell any. So what would that look like? That is a really tough question because there is there's so much in there for different audiences. If you're if you're interested in in history, you'd want to read the history chapter obviously. If you're more interested in in philosophy, you'd go for the philosophy chapter. If you're interested more in in sort of attacking the fundamental assumptions at the root of the social justice movement, you would go for the chapter on truths that you're not allowed to say anymore in public. 
uh, if you want to if you want to make fun of the of this movement and see how silly and narrow it has become, you would go to the chapter on entry level politics that we were describing earlier. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in victimization or how this manifests in street violence, there are chapters for that as well. And finally, if you think that you just want to hear the solutions to this problem, I offer solutions to this problem. There are no silver bullets, of course, but I think it's a place to start. So I really I, I can't narrow down one chapter because they are all in my view, very important. That's why I wrote them all. So, uh, yeah, yeah, but there is definitely something in there for everybody. So since I am on YouTube and the audience is younger, a lot of them are aspiring Noah Rothmans, you know, aspiring Ben Shapiro's people who'd really like to see themselves doing more of what you do. The conclusion was great reading about your wife and the sacrifice and you kind of learning the hard realization of what it took to get the book out. Can you just spend a couple minutes talking about the challenge of publishing the book and the challenge of working in your industry, which is undergoing such massive changes and advice you have for young 20 somethings eager to, to go out there and make a difference. They've got their room clean now. they want to go out and change the world. Yeah. Well, I, 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 so I don't really know, uh, how to advise somebody who wants to write a book because it just, it took me a long time to get in that direction. I always knew I wanted to write a book, but I needed something to say first. And that took a long time to get to a place where I had something to say. Um, the first thing you need to do if you want to write, read a book is write a book or I'm sorry, write a book is read a book and read a lot of books. Um, and then you need to go out and have experiences in the world. You know, I was out there writing about identity politics and how deleterious to the social fabric identity politics was. But it wasn't until I was uh, on a junket in Ukraine before I really understood that what I was witnessing there in, in, a, in a very retributive and uh, elementary form of identity politics in practice as an alternative theory of social organization, a retributive and vengeful theory of social organization, that I, what, what I was seeing was identity politics in practice. Uh, as an as a as a new way to govern, as an identity, as a theory of governing that uh, governance ethos that is alien in this country, thankfully, and that's what led me to want to write this book about social justice because the the founding ideals in this country are in many ways hostile towards and antithetical towards the kind of governance that social justice advocates would like to see happen in this country. But that's not a permanent condition. You know, freedom is only one generation away. From, a, from an existential challenge. And so the, the work is, is constant and unending. And for the 20-somethings who want to write, write a book and start writing, um, definitely start writing now for free as much as you can as practice, but also read. Read as much as you possibly can. Take in as much information as you possibly can and then go have a life and have some experiences because then you will have something to say. Um, you know, we've been pretty serious. You're obviously a really smart guy, but you know, just to show that you can party as well. Um, Super Bowl <laughs> met your expectations. Did not commercials were they terrible? Like, what 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 are your thoughts on the weekend? Well, it was extremely boring as a game. Um, but you know, I wasn't really I wasn't hearing the game or the commercials because I have two young children, and I <laughs> was at a friend's house who also has two young children, and the two of them were operating at a decibel level around like nine or ten. So you you could see it, but you couldn't really hear much of what was going on. But my friend, uh, and I was just talking about this on Twitter, I was reading an article in the Washington Post about how awful everything is and how we can't even enjoy the Super Bowl together anymore because just look at how Twitter reacts to it. And I wanted to be like, well, I was at my very left-wing friend's house eating – wings and having spiked seltzers and talking a little bit about politics, but mostly just enjoying life because politics is really only a very minor part of American life. And life is not Twitter. Twitter is a, is a funhouse mirror reflection of what real life is. Get out in the world and turn off the social media and you really will not see the catastrophized world that, that these people inhabit online where everything is an existential threat and everyone is an enemy and you inhabit this unnavigable matrix of overlapping prejudices that prevent you from realizing your objectives in life. It is an illusion and a dangerous one. Go outside, man. It's not that bad out there. Yeah. Amen to that. Uh, I was, I was going to say, I've noticed on social media, people are posting their old favorite Super Bowl ads, which tells you a lot about this year, but I think taking four <laughs> kids under 10 years old is a good way to drown out the uh, halftime show. So good, good coverage on that. Um, Twitter. Yeah. I feel like I've, I've, uh, told my wife, Twitter's kind of like the black venom suit that you drip on you and then it gets on and you're trying to pull it off. And then when it's all the way on, you start doing things that hurt people. Like I hate Twitter, but I can't stop doing it. But you have, yeah, but you, I mean, and it, it is a tool. It is an important tool and I struggle with its necessity sometimes, but, uh, it's certainly invaluable when you're, 
uh, trying to re- promote a book. So uh, I won't be going anywhere anytime soon. Well, the last thing I was going to do was read some of your negative reviews on Amazon and let you refute them. But yours are genuinely all from people who have chromosomal defects and have not read the book. So I think that'd be a total waste of time. But uh, some I- of them even say they haven't read the book. So it's it's kind of hard to say that there's a that there's any negative reviews there. There's one three star <laughs> review that I found pretty, uh, pretty valuable because it was complimentary, but at the same time critical in ways. And, and I like, I like the criticism. I appreciate getting pushback on this. I'm taking this message to venues that are hostile towards it. I'm taking it to MSNBC and Vox and, uh, and Julie Reginsky's podcast and trying to engage with people who are predisposed to disagree with me vehemently. Um, because this is a conversation that, exists primarily on the right and only on the right and on the left and only on the left and the tween never meet. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to break down is, uh, this is a conversation that needs to be much broader and hopefully this book is a step in that direction. Yeah. He said the author's level headed critique of Trump and the alt right. I think he was actually able to express his critique of his right more con- concisely than his critique of the left. Well, there you go. The book definitely improved towards the end overall due to the suggestions and the most level headed critique of the alt right I've ever seen. I like this book. That's all right. It's not really too much to count on that. But yeah, everything below three stars is garbage. That's I mean, it's mostly about the left. So that means she, <laughs> this reviewer didn't really like most of the book. But uh, I'll take it. I'll take what I can get. Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, express my personal gratitude for what I've read so far. I got a couple chapters left. But for everyone listening, go check out Noah Rothman's book. You can also uh, see his work at Commentary Magazine. The title is Unjust, Social Justice, and the Unmaking of America. Sharp guy, sharp writing, and uh, a really, really important conversation that you need to be ready to have with people about the topic. So, no, I appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, TJ. I really appreciate it. All right. Best of luck. 